Stuff Podcasts. Warning. This podcast deals with racism, so expect explicit language. We were asked by the community, what are you going to do about dorm raids? Why don't we raid the ministers? We all got together, a bus two in the morning. And we're all decked out in our panther gears. What's it been, Okan? Nervy as hell. Pumped with adrenaline. Prepared to get arrested. Prepared to fight. This is what's going to happen if you continue dawn raiding us in our area. We'll come out to you. In 1976, the Polynesian Panther Party is over 500 strong, 10 chapters up and down Aotearoa. Fierce brothers and sisters, we are Pacifica, we are Māori, we are Kiwis. Here we are about to raid government officials in their homes before dawn. But long before risking our freedom as Polynesian Panthers, we were simply Polynesians. Our families are part of a long line of people born and bred in the small islands of the South Pacific. But in the 1950s, our parents looked for a new life in Aotearoa, making us the first generation of New Zealand-born Pacific Islanders. But later, in the 1970s, when the economy faced challenges, some New Zealanders started to see our presence as a problem. Newspaper headlines claimed we were violent and dangerous. And the government said we took Kiwis jobs. The government wanted us out. Like the Black Panther movement in the United States, we decided to seize the time. It was time to be heard. It was time to mobilise. It was time to fight back. We formed a Polynesian Panther Party. The aim was to strike at the core of racism and provide a voice for our community. But leading our people to fight for a fair and just society wasn't without sacrifice. This is our history. These are our words. Talofa, my name is Milani Anai. I am a Polynesian Panther. Our people are navigators. We learn to read the stars, the waves, the winds, and the currents to find new lands. In the 1950s, it was our parents' turn to look towards the horizon. This time, leaving their Pacific Islands and atolls for Aotearoa. A visit to the hospital is one of the last stages in the process of emigrating to New Zealand. Now, block one eye, read the whole line. In English? Yes. Yeah. Um, C, L, E, B. Although New Zealand's comparatively close, there's an air of finality to this farewell. My name is Tingilo Ness, former Minister of Fine Arts and Associate Minister of Culture for the Polynesian Panthers. 
I saw all my cousins and aunties and uncles, you know, as they migrated slowly over because Dad was one of the first Niwe. Dad came here in 1950 before sending a uh, fair to my mum and my sister to come over. They came over about 1953 and I was born a couple of years later. We got to New Zealand via my grandma. Granny travelled to New Zealand with Grandpa. They set up house at 87 Great North Road. Dad, he ended up joining the Fijian Army. He met Mum while he was on furlough in Samoa. He was showing off his tap dancing skills. He said, I was the first one to bring tap dancing to Samoa. <laughs> Grandma sent for Dad. He came first and then sent for Mum and the other children. Marole, my name is Will Irola here, co-founder of the Polynesian Panther Party. We, we were probably the first full-blooded Tongans to come to New Zealand. And my mum was noble. And Dad was a widower and he was a commoner. When the uh, banana shed on the wharf was empty, it doubled up as a movie theatre. The band was a colourful old jazz band. Their job was to translate, you know, through music, what the story's all about. Mum being noble and that kind of stuff, privileged to sit with the royal family in the front. Dad was telling me he was literally serenading my mum. Dad at that time was working in the British High Com. A Governor General visited and the High Commissioner said, hey, hey why don't you uh, give uh, Molly Mera a job to train him as a butler or something like that because he can't marry his girlfriend, you know? My name is Alec Toliafor. My official name is Alexander Toliafor. My mum couldn't pronounce Alexander, so oh, it really? became Alec. Yeah. <laughs> I joined the Polynesian Panthers when I was 16. My mum and dad came from different parts of Samoa. My father, he came from Western Samoa, and my mother is from the furthest eastern part. How they met, I'm not quite sure. In the church, they met, <laughs> they met at the church. My name's Wayne Toliofor. I was the Minister of Information. My Panther number was 29. My father came here to find work. He was hoping for a chance at education again. And my mother came here just to find a job. They met, got married, and then had five of us, one after another. They were just one of thousands of civic people in that first wave of large numbers coming here to help develop and build the infrastructure of Aotearoa New Zealand. The old's rapidly giving way to the new in New Zealand. New buildings are mushrooming everywhere. The economy is loosening up. There's a feeling of confidence in the air. In short, there's a boom on. We're in God's own country. Gotta take the time to take a look around us. Kia ora, Paul Spoonley. Uh, I was a sociologist studying Pacific migrants to Auckland in the 1970s. So we had that period of major industrial and urban expansion through the 50s and 60s. Initially the labour market needs were met by migrants, particularly from the Netherlands and from the UK. By the mid-1960s that source was drying up, wasn't sufficient for the labour market expansion. There were two new sources. One was the rural hinterland, so that migration of Māori into our major cities. And then they began to look around for other labour market sources and they looked to the Pacific. And so from the 60s you began to get this labour market migration to New Zealand. The Pacifica who were coming here were looking for jobs but also education for their children. They saw a brighter future. New Zealand is yours. Go there now. From the New Zealand end, they needed people in factories. Auckland, the largest city in New Zealand, with a population of over half a million people. It's a gracious city, well planned and still growing fast. Waitemata Harbour, the sea of sparkling waters. You can look down on it from modern hotels.
Welcome to the unofficial capital of Polynesia, Auckland. From the magic of the South Seas, from the Europeans' dream of paradise, they come to New Zealand. The Auckland suburbs of Pontonby and Grey Lynn were our home. All new migrants to Aotearoa settled here. We made it our neighbourhood, our big playground. I was uh, surrounded by a lot of Tongans in it. And our house, well that's the thing about my mum and dad, our house, we were like, uh, it was like the first uh, immigration hostel. In the backyard they were telling me what the words were for tree and, and Tongan and I would tell them what English words were. The Kazis used to go like to North Shore, walk through the western way over to the shore, fish and walk back to Greyland Ponsonby and feed us. It was like going to bush for them. They dug umu, hung it, you know, to feed everybody. And that was my first uh, sight of our culture. We were just like a wild bunch of kids, you know, roaming the streets. We used to have umus in the backyard, but they soon uh, made a law to stop those. Dad killing chickens, you know, to cook, uh, all in the backyard. So we were just so friendly with our neighbours. They had the only TV in the street. We would all pile into their house when they would allow us to, and it was virtually every night, just about. Now, over the years, we had so many people staying at our house. It was like, you know, a bus stop. Dad would bring home new migrants. We used to love camping. Like a whole busload of us <laughs> would hire a bus, take us to the campsite, which was Huya, watching them catch fish and then cooking it and eating it and the singing at night. You know, someone would pull out a guitar or a uke and off we went. We didn't see each other's ethnicity because. Our parents were everybody's parents, and our homes were everybody's homes, so we could go and crash in a Croatian house and eat Croatian food and learn about Croatia. You know, while we were there, why are you doing this? Why are you doing that? And then they come to our house. That was our neighbourhood. We used to get, you know, a lot of watermelon and, you know, all the Tongan food and that kind of stuff. Mr. Lawnsley, who was a Pakia guy next door to us, went in and knock on his door and I had a melon. And presented it to him, you know, and he said, no, oh, no, no, you know, as if he thought it was something bad. And I said, no, no, we're giving this yet, you know, we, you know, we're neighbours. And then he became real friends and started to realise that, you know, we're, we're OK for human beings. The church was a big part of our lives. Pacific Island Presbyterian Church in uh, Newton. It was just nestled between the pink pussy cat and the pleasure chest. <laughs> <laughs> this is before the mega churches. We had 1,500 people on a Sunday. We were all immigrants from the Pacific Islands. It was like a village. They say it takes a village to raise a child. That's where you learned to be a Pacific Islander, I suppose. It was great. You know, we used to hear the Cook Island hymn singing. It was like in six-part harmony. It was so beautiful. Our ministers, they, they met people at the airport, and they were the social service. The Reverend uh, Leo Tio quite an instrumental guy in the whole thing. We believe that the best way to uphold or to retain any culture is to live it. We encourage all sorts of activities in the church. Uh, dancing, for instance, and in all gatherings we try to bring the children to watch and learn for themselves. That's the best way to do it. Talofa, my name is Eta Schmidt and I am a Polynesian panther. The mum ensured that we all got to know that there's Samoan people in the area. The Samoan traditional dancing, Milani was so good. It wasn't really me. I just enjoy the food and... <laughs> <laughs> 
Sunday was my best day for smelling food because we'd have a kongai, which was a big family lunch after church. This was the ritual on a Sunday. I would wake up at seven, you know, I loved my little transistor radio, and all the family would gather around and listen to the fairy stories. My name is Jack. I've been climbing a beanstalk for hours. And then my job was to scrape the coconut. That was my job before I even went to Sunday school. It was a must that we went to Sunday school and church and it just became natural after a while. I was the only one in my family to do so well at school. There was one teacher that stood out for me. Her name was Miss Jordan. One school holiday, she invited some of us kids to go to her farm and ride a horse. I'd never ridden a horse. I just felt really valued that this teacher, this Palangi teacher, would ask me to go to her house. Before going to primary school, my sisters went. And I always wanted, I want to go to school, I want to, you know. And then the day my mum took me to school, I ran after her. Mum! <laughs> and she stopped at the gates and told me to go back. And it was a teacher, Mrs Gilmore, who put me by her feet under the piano and just played for all the kids in the class. And that sort of calmed me down, soothed me down. Mrs Gilmore. We had a park at the back of our house, lots of friends, our multicultural neighbours were very good. For us, growing up there, it was a happy place. Everybody shop at the tip-top shop. Always feel completely at ease in white jockey. See less of the kitchen, more of the family. Post-war New Zealand was insular, conservative, stifling. I'm Trevor Richards, chairperson of Heart. Heart was the whole for racist tours movement. I was part of the Guard of Honour for the Queen, and the headmaster at our college said, this will be the most important event of your life. The Queen looked like any other person her age at the Kaikoui AMP show. There was nothing, nothing stood out about the thing. New Zealand is very monocultural, it is very monolingual, it's very boring. People forget how unexciting it was, you know, the, the things we take for granted, the very good coffee or the diversity of food, cultural diversity of the country, the role and centrality of tikanga Māori or te reo Māori, none of that existed. When you're growing up as a kid, you feel you're just the same as your peers. But then, when you hit secondary school, that's when I felt really different. The different lunches and the different chat, I didn't fit in. You know, all I knew was church, family, school. Ponsonby was our home, you know, the church was our home. Once you ventured out from there, like some of us went to Mount Albert Grammar School, which at that time was a middle-class Pākehās, you know, or Pālangi. That was the first time that many of us had experienced racism, you know, name-calling, singling you out for being a Polynesian. A young guy that I'd known from church comes up and tells us, oh, they said that I can't play down on the soccer field because it's whites only. Oh, my God, I couldn't believe it could not believe that someone would say that. I went down onto the field. There were some older Palangi guys. Grabbed the ball. Who said no blacks can play? And of course, none of them admitted what they said. So I threw the ball at the biggest guy. 
If I ever hear that again, I'm going to come down here and give you guys a hiding. Just the anger of hearing that and watching the, the face of our young brother. My name's Nigel Barner. I was a member in Pampa Youth. I went to Mount Abergrama. I was blind as a bat, so I always sat in the front of the class. My form teacher, he threw me at the back. I told him I couldn't see the blackboard. He told me it didn't really matter. What do you mean it doesn't really matter? I said, I can't see the blackboard. He said, I don't care. There's three Polynesians and myself in the class, and we all sat at the back. I went through primary, intermediate, and right till I left school, I could hardly read or write. No one cared. And that happened to a lot of my mates. A whole bunch of us got sent over to England to become like little Englishmen. I lived next door to a Trinidadian, his name was George Washington. You know, we related as islanders. He was Caribbean and I was Pacific. But then when we went to school, he was called nigger and coon and all that kind of number, and I was sort of... I was romanticised as the South Sea Islander playing a ukulele underneath a coconut tree, which George was doing in the Caribbean. It was that experience that when I came back to New Zealand and went to Mount Albert Grammar and I was receiving the same stuff that George was receiving over in England, that probably gave me a bit of an advantage to understand what racism was all about. Brill cream makes the most of a man. Brill cream makes the most of a man's hair. Instead of brill cream and combing it straight, we started growing afros because we looked at the Black Panthers, of course. Ah, when we finally found out the Afro buzz, we knew who we were. Yeah, black is beautiful. Be proud of who you are. Nobody had said that to us before. And then in our neighbourhood, it became competitive. The bigger the Afro, you know, you know, and the girls who had frizzy hair naturally did the same thing too. Going to school, my Afro got bigger and bigger, you know. New culture, new tradition, the hair has grown long. The eldest son gets a hair cutting ceremony. The headmaster called me up into his office one day and said to me, Ness, get a haircut. But sir, I'm a new and my hair is long because of my culture. No, Ness, get a haircut. What about these white boys who got hair below their collar? Their parents were surfies, some six formers, just groomed beards and, and long hair. He didn't care, didn't understand. I just stormed out of his office. Fuck you. I, I saw red. And why me? Everybody, you know, why me? One night I'm walking back from a friend of mine, a senior friend of mine, 15 with an afro. It's about nine o'clock. I get to Toll Street and there a police patrol stops me and asks me where I've been. I've just been to see a friend. Whereabouts, all these kinds of questions. Said, oh, well, just over there in Ponsonby. I'm already nervous. Uh, you know, this is my first time ever being confronted with this, in this way. Why are you asking me all these questions? Do you fit the description of someone we're looking for? Hang on a minute. I look like everybody else in Ponsonby. Are you trying to be smart? No, no, I'm not trying to be smart. Next thing you know, handcuffs in the car, taken off to... Arthur Street, which was a uh, cul-de-sac. And they started telling me that I was just being smart and I was being cheeky. So out comes the torch, it whacked. You won't be behaving like that again, will you? And I just went straight home after that, quite shocked. 
and I know that this was happening frequently in Ponsonby and in other parts. I actually thought of taking the cops to court, but I didn't have the resources to do that. At home, we were Samoan, Tongan or Nguyen, but we were also Kiwis, born here, trying to compete and live in a modernising New Zealand. Some of our community leaders recognised this, like the Reverend Lewa Te Asio. The, the difficulties that our young people are facing at the moment, they're more or less living in two worlds, a different world in a home and a different uh, type of atmosphere they have outside the home. Our struggle to find an identity affected us all in different ways. I, I more or less drifted out of home. I said no to the headmaster. I took it as, you know, that was, I wasn't going back there again. The main thing that was in my mind was my mum. All of this, my mum. She'll be really, really upset. All the books and the shoes that I used to get, you know, she scrimped and saved for all those. And I went to a top school. That, that hurt me more, you know. Um, so I was afraid to face her. I started hanging out in the streets. And we'd go to the uh, plonk shop and buy cheap wine and drink and get drunk and um, go to the dances after. And I would have gone into prison. You know, ended up in boys' home and stuff. My neighbourhood uh, friends were going in and out of homes. Waikiria boys' home, or Waraka boys' home. If it hadn't been for my mum's teaching, you know, I would have ended up there too. A week after my 17th birthday, my brother, his fiance, my sister, her husband and baby had gone to Samoa for a, for a Christmas holiday and um, were due back. Then we got the horrible news that uh, the plane had crashed. Not long after that, my mother passed away and my grandmother passed away, all in that year, 1970. That's when I started to just internalise my pain, my anger, everything else. How can there be a God when he could let this happen? Seven people in my family gone. You know, it was a miracle that I was able to just get sit the exam without attending school for six months and pass the bursary and get into university, you know. I think I just tried to put it away and not think of it because I would have gone over the edge, I think. I knew my obligation as the only girl left at home. I had to put that away and meet my obligations, look after Dad, just carry on like that. Well, my struggle for uh, identity expressed itself in very negative, angry terms. We got involved in a, in a um, fight in the bottom of town. We'd all been out drinking, and one of our group, we see him running back up Queen Street towards us. And as soon as that crowd saw that he was not alone, we just had this massive blue. I had agreed with my friend that if push comes to shove, I will take the rap because he was already on probation. And I just disappeared and just hung out at different friends, friends' places. I went home just to get fresh clothes and, and just sleep. I hear this knock, knock on the door and I hear my mum asking these police, what do you want? I just turned myself in and just said, yeah, it is me. And I could see the, just the hurt on my mum's face and how hard that was for her. So I was just appalled, 
uh, at myself, really. When I was uh, appeared in court, then I saw the the injured person come in in a wheelchair, and I I was told by my lawyer that I was this close to facing a manslaughter charge. On Ponsonby Road, we were called, you know, niggers and bongers and coconuts go home and all that. So, you know, we said, oh, we'll call ourselves niggers. You know, you call it a gang these days, but we, we just call it a group. That was happening, you know, practically every day. I mean, even when I was catching bus from Sandringham to go to university, people wouldn't, well, you know, you, you could see when I sit down next to them and that kind of number was like, you know, they would they, they blatantly get up and go and sit in another seat. So, you know, what we do is we all go and sit in the back of the bus. People would actually get up and move somewhere else. The ladies would grab their handbags. You could feel the looks that you got every day. It just made us like the Samoan Mutu, which means being stubbornly silent, internalising it, being sad and sometimes angry about it. Keith Holyoke, the Prime Minister, told us that we had the best race relations in the world, and yet I doubt that there would have been very many Pākehā who would have known the difference then between a Pōwhiri and a Waiata. It was good race relations if you were Pākehā. Assimilation was the official policy, and of course the problem, I think, going down this assimilation path, it didn't take long to discover that it was a hoax. Psst. You're listening to a podcast from stuff.co.nz. I know you're enjoying it because you've been listening for quite a while. I'm here to tell you about another Stuff podcast you'll enjoy. Stuff to Watch is our weekly guide to the very best new TV shows and movies. It drops every Friday, just in time for your weekend viewing. I'm the host, James Crute, and in just 10 minutes, my expert guests and I will cut through the clutter and find you some Stuff to Watch. You can find every episode at stuff.co.nz slash stuff to watch. Better still, on Apple and Spotify, you'll find links so you can subscribe, which means you'll get new episodes the moment they're published. So let Stuff to Watch find you, well, Stuff to Watch. Thanks for listening, as you were. By international standards, New Zealanders live well. Well, that's what it says in the official guidebook to New Zealand. And as one travels around this country and has a look about, one doesn't see very much to make one argue with that view. There's virtually no unemployment, the book that goes on. Most houses have washing machines, and New Zealanders have one of the highest calorie intakes in the world. Here in the suburbs, it doesn't look as though disaster is about to strike. We had that period of major industrial and urban expansion through the 50s and 60s. It all came to a grinding halt and there was a moral panic. For the first time you began to get serious unemployment in this country. And so a narrative emerged which demonised Pacifica. There's these people from the Pacific Islands, I don't know, we can't absorb them, can we? You know, we can't educate them, they're not used to our way of life, they don't know the language. Let's keep their own British stuff. Police raided Black Panther headquarters in Chicago and Los Angeles. The officers had a search warrant and raided just before dawn. Police said the Panthers had opened fire when the police entered, but the Panthers denied it. They said the police had broken in and killed one man at close range as he slept. At that time, you know, there was front page news and on television was the shootouts that the Black Panthers were having in America. You know, so we were, you know, sort of started to click in to say, oh, what's happening with these people? I picked up the Black Panthers book, you know, Caesar Time. Shit, what they're talking about is what we've got here in New Zealand. In America, uh, black people are uh, treated very much as uh, the Vietnamese people or any other colonized people because we're used, we're brutalized. Violence is a part of America's culture. It is as American as cherry pie. American taught the black people to be violent. We will use that violence to rid ourselves of oppression if necessary. 
And it's time that the people see the necessity of moving against that power structure, moving against those, the ruling class circles, it's the, it's the right to equality, the right to human existence, the right to land, water, and air. Nari Malaysia, who's, um, who's the don of the King Cobras, while he was doing time, the King Cobras kind of lost their um, rank, so to speak, on the street, and us next came up in regard to the street fighting. He called us together. And there was us from the Knicks, some of his old King Cobra guys, the Apaches, a couple of guys from Golden Chains that were, you know, all sort of eyeing each other. And he said, look, we've got to stop this fighting amongst ourselves. We call ourselves the Black Panther. So we all came, became Black Panthers, you know. But what was happening, though, we were getting drunk and now when we were sitting together in the lounges and we were still fighting each other in the lounge rather than on the street. Some of the boys that I was giving the Black Panthers a book to, we were starting to learn about a, a lot of things and we looked at each other and said, this is not on. We literally got up and walked out and set up the Polynesian Panthers on the 16th of June. 1971, Keppel Street at Fred Schmidt's house. That house was actually in my backyard just about. Etta, who was Fred's sister, she invited me around. Fred, my brother, um, was the co-founder of the Polynesian Panther Party. He asked me to bring uh, my friends along. He knew that we'd bring a, a positive, a soft approach. They needed the girls to help, to help them with it. I had to sneak out because I couldn't tell Dad where I was going. We took the shortcut through the houses. I was worried about a fight break out. <laughs> I was worried because there were so many boys in the room. Us girls are huddled up together. The guys with black leather jackets on. Never saw any of them before, that's why I was a bit iffy. Some of the girls, like Milani and them, were poking their head through the window and outside the door and they're listening in. Will was talking about racism and my ears pricked out. It was just us, a group of guys, pissed off of Nari, and so we thought, yeah, no, we'll, let's set this up, and that's why we said, you know, well, let's call it the Polynesian Panthers. So at least it doesn't upset Nari with his black panther, but at the same time, at least it also acknowledges that we weren't black, <laughs> you know? Pacific island in the city. A few years ago, these streets spawned gangs and so gang brawls. Today, some of the gangs still exist. Others have lost their members to a different sort of organization with different aims and different activities. We needed recruits. We wanted a fair representation of ethnic minorities. We wanted gender equality and we ended up having just as many women as we did men. I saw it in the West End News, you know, the formation of the Polynesian Panthers and the picture of the founders, including Will and a few people I knew. And I went along to one of their meetings. A lot of it resonated with me and I thought I can identify with it. My brother was already involved with the Panthers. Then I saw him getting excited and all animated about it. Maybe that's, maybe that's what I need to be getting into instead of all the stuff I'm doing right now. Mapa Yuli, you know, we sat down out on the street in the gutter one day and we were talking. He says, oh, you got to come and join this group. This is a new group. We're not a gang and we, we help our people. When I first went along to the meeting, we had to be investigated, of course, to see if we were not, uh, you know, crims and thieves and robbers and stuff. I liked what I saw and heard, talking about revolution, and doing positive things. And with a charismatic leader like Will, of course, 
I, I learned about I, more about my identity and what I was able to do and can do and should do. Will structured us almost ad verbatim as, as the Black Panther Party. A chairman coordinates the activities of the group's executive, which consists of portfolio holders, the Minister of Culture, the Minister of Information, of Finance and of Defence. We set up our headquarters, Panther HQ, in an office on Ponsonby Road. It's where our fierce sister, and mother to my son, and later my wife, Miriama Rauhihines, worked hard, filtering all the calls from our community. The first thing we had to do was to try and kill the gang label. Our main enemy at the beginning were our own folks, our own community. There were a lot of people at church saying, don't rock the boat, we are guests in this country. What they needed and we understood was politicising, you know. We can't go on, we won't stand for it. The first programmes that we did was taking out these old people in Ponsonby. And, you know, getting the comment, oh, you speak English. <laughs> oh, you speak English. That was huge for me. They didn't even think we spoke English, and I was born here. People just don't know what they don't know. It wasn't that they were racist or anything. They just took on what the media was telling them who we were. No, the Panthers is not a racist group. We had a lot of Pākehā friends, but we stood up for Pacific Island rights and Maori rights as well especially Maori rights, because they were the people that were here first. Dressed all in black with a beret, if your afro wasn't too big, we organised. We helped our community to fight back. Learning from the platform of the Black Panthers, we set up homework centres so that our kids could catch up on their education. A food co-op with the Ponsonby People's Union so our people could afford to eat. We also joined our Māori brothers and sisters at Ngā Tamatoa and petitioned for Te Reo to become an official language. We also organised a free bus service so people could visit their friends and brothers in prison. Bus used to leave from the Blue Pot on a Saturday and go up to Parry. You didn't know who you are going to visit. They were all doing life, they were all lifers tell them about what bullshit the All Blacks are doing and that. And that's how I actually met my wife. We were both on the prison visit. She was sitting right next to me. And we stopped outside the club. I said, come on. I had some coin, so let's go get a drink. We set up a chapter in Dunedin where everyone was Palangi. I wasn't invisible because I had this big afro and my round glasses and I was dark so I could be seen anywhere. I'm Mary Manata Montgomery. I started up the Polynesian Panther chapter in Dunedin. And we made a controversial visit to Christchurch. That was like confronting the KKK. A lot of the cops that were coming up here, they were from the South Island and they had no inkling of what it was like to work or know a Polynesian. At that time, a lot of the housing was extremely poor and run down and landlords were reluctant to fix them up. Pacific families were some of the worst affected. A person came up to our office seeking help because uh, the landlord was going to evict them and there wasn't a clear rationale for why they were being evicted and the place was not up to a good standard anyway and I think that was the issue was that they had been asking the landlord time and time again to make these improvements. The buildings were old and it had creepy crawlies everywhere and rats sometimes. You could hear them scurrying in between the walls. I used to go to sleep and listen to them scurrying across the ceiling and down the walls. There was no heat. Just have a kerosene heater. In the sitting room and used to be a bowl of water with onion in it. And that's meant to take away the smell. In your advertisement offering accommodation, you specify Europeans preferred. 
That's to say, you, you do not want to have as a tenant anyone who is colored. I would prefer not to have as a tenant anyone who is colored. The general mood was to kick us out. We had to find creative ways to fight back. We encouraged these tenants to just put their rent into another account and not pay any rent. There was one case in where I had to barricade ourselves into the building waiting for the landlord to, to remove you physically. The house was packed. You couldn't get in, let alone try and get somebody out. My name is Roger Fowler, coordinator of the People's Union. Many, many times the landlord would turn up with his bullies. When these guys came down, there was Eden security at the time came down to this property. They saw that we were like their nephews. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, they were our uncles. So they said, what are you doing here? And said, oh, well, you know, because this is what's happening. This is what's happening. And the next time it's going to be your house. Then they started doing other tactics, which came from the Depression years, where they'd just get up and, ta and take the iron off the roof. We just organised people and bring a couple of hammers, and especially if there's a few chippies involved, and put the roof back on again. <laughs> In the 70s, the issue for Pacific migrants was settlement. Then for the first of the first, the issue was identity. The Panthers just gave me that extra dimension of an organised way to be different. And it was my way of breaking my silent temperament to one that, OK, I can find my voice here, I can fight back. I am a Samoan, but not a Samoan. My Ainga call me Palangi. I am a New Zealander, but not a New Zealander. Two New Zealanders, I am a bloody coconut or a Pacific Islander. I am my Samoan parent's child. We were young, angry voices screaming out in the dark. We felt like our programs were making a difference, but there was still so much injustice and racism. An invitation had been made to our parents in the 1950s to come and work hard in this new land of milk and honey. But 20 years on, as New Zealand faced tougher economic times, it felt like that invitation was being withdrawn. On any day, I'd be thinking, what's likely to happen today? Pacifica became a target. I would be expecting carloads of people to come by and yell out these racist epithets. And sometimes those carloads of racists were an agent for the government. I would be expecting that I'd become a suspect. But we were already suspects before we even left home. Can you understand here? Show me your passport. in the next episode of Once a Panther. We refer to them as a, as a freak squad. You would look up from your beer, policemen with these trench coats and chunches just standing there. And they said, have you got your passport on you? I said, are you looking for overstayers? They were taught intimidate them, get them to make wrong move, and then arrest them. I was born in this country, I was brought up in this country. Muldoon campaigned that he was going to set this country right, targeting Pacific Islanders. I know the ordinary bloke in this country, doesn't matter where he comes from or what he is. Muldoon had already had a few too many gins, pushed his way through the crowd. I'll take you on one at a time, I'll take you on. Once a Panther is a stuff podcast, written, produced, mixed and edited by Brad Flayhive and Alex Liu. Additional creative input by Stuff's podcast director, Adam Dudding. Original music by Andrew Faliatua. Executive produced by Carol Hirschfeld. 
If you want to know more, head to stuff.co.nz forward slash once a panther, where you'll find links to every episode, as well as photos, artwork, and feature articles. You'll also find links for subscribing on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, and so on. If you're listening on Apple, don't forget to give Once a Panther a five-star rating and review. It helps other listeners find us. This episode included audio from the Marina McCartney film Milk and Honey, Getty, TVNZ, Archives New Zealand, and the Radio New Zealand collection at Natalna Sound and Vision. This podcast was made possible with help from New Zealand On Air. Hi, Adam Dudding here, Stuff's podcast director. If you're enjoying this podcast, how about contributing to the Stuff supporter program? You can contribute any amount you choose, and you can do it just once or monthly or annually. Direct support from people like you helps us produce the kind of journalism you're listening to right now. Go to stuff.co.nz forward slash support.